So this uh, good evening, uh, my name is Rashad Kasaba, and I am very pleased uh, to be Mr. Jackson for International Studies. I'm pleased for that too, but I am very pleased to welcome you to uh, this evening's uh, presentation. This is one of the marquee events we have in the Jackson School, uh, lecture, uh, annual lectures uh, dedicated named after uh, Griffith and Patricia Way. And I am especially pleased and happy that uh, Griff Way is with us this evening. Uh, many of you know the very distinguished uh, career Griff had and the contributions he made to Japanese studies and also to the University of Washington. Uh, both Griff and Patricia were lifelong advocates of supporting and promoting the knowledge, appreciation, and preservation of Japanese art and culture. They have done this through their individual efforts and also through many organizations that uh, they were involved in. Um, Griff uh, is a native of Seattle and his adult life uh, has revolved around Japan since his service as a naval officer and was trained as a Japanese interpreter and translator. He is also a University of Washington Law School Distinguished Alumni and has practiced law in Japan and in the United States. He has served on many boards, including Seattle Art Museum and the Blakemore Foundation, and also the Jackson School of International Studies. And that is the first time that I met him and I started uh, my tenure as the director of the school. Uh, along the way, uh, Griff and Patricia collected uh, numerous arts, uh, uh, mostly modern Japanese paintings and prints, and these have toured the country, and many people have uh, enjoyed uh, this very exquisite collection. And we are especially, of course, lucky that the Seattle Art Museum has its permanent collection, uh, some of these uh, pieces. So I'd like to invite you to acknowledge Chris's presence here, and if you could thank him once again for his presence. And in addition to Griff, uh, Bill and Mary are with us, and so is Clark, and we are very pleased to have all of them here. Now I'm going to turn over to uh, my colleague, Sadia, Sadia Pekinen, who is a professor of international relations and Japan studies in the Jackson School, to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Before I do that, I hope you will realize the very special lengths that we've had to go through to bring Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to Florida this week, <laughs> and me, President Trump, to make this lecture especially interesting and timely for all of us. Thank you, everyone. Uh, like Rashad, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, evening's event, the 2018 Way Lecture. And I think, as you pointed out, the timing could not be better. It's almost as if we had uh, planned it. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the uh, Griffith and Patricia Way Lecture Endowment a series that has been with us for so many years and will, of course, continue forward in the future as well. I want to say a few uh, framing uh, words uh, because uh, for this uh, particular lecture, uh, as Ashok was pointing out, uh, I study and work on um, Japan's international relations and foreign policy. And I would say that the, given the fact that the world is in flux, whether we are looking at the United States or Europe or Asia, I would say uh, that as a researcher, uh, Japan is really at a very historic and pivotal moment as it rethinks and sort of reshapes both its regional and global role. Uh, can Japan, will Japan, step up, um, as the title suggests, uh, to uh, uphold the world order? How will it do so? What are the consequences of its actions or not actions for bigger issues of peace and stability going forward? Now, to help us think through uh, these issues, uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have a leading Japanese voice providing an insight and perspective on where Japan is and where it's actually headed. And this is a perspective that I think in America we need to appreciate a little bit more 
and that here in the other Washington, we also need to sort of bring um, uh, to bear on the things that we do. So it's my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, Takako Hikotani. Uh, she has a, a BA in political science from Keio University. She also has uh, two masters, both in political science from Stanford University and Keio uh, University. Her PhD uh, is in political science uh, from Columbia uh, University, and she focused on issues of uh, the paradoxes of anti-militarism and civil-military relations in the post-war period. A very few scholars actually working on this um, uh, particular uh, area. I'm not going to try to summarize uh, you know, everything that she has done, but let me just highlight a few things that I think are important. Uh, in terms of her primary appointments, I think you see here, she is the uh, Gerald Bell Curtis Associate Professor for uh, Modern Japan and Japanese Foreign Policy. And she's, she's been at Columbia uh, since 2017 and is going to stay there uh, for, I believe, another um, year um, as well. But before that, and what's uh, uh, particularly interesting is that her teaching career uh, started in the National Defense Academy, where she was first an assistant professor and then an associate professor in the Department of Public Policy. For those of you who don't know, uh, the National Defense Academy is where Japan uh, really trains and sort of educates its uh, military uh, leaders for the Japan Self-Defense uh, Forces. Uh, she has won numerous awards, um, the Abe Fellowship, the Suntory uh, Fellowship, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the Suntory Foundation Tory Fellowship, and was also a Columbia University uh, President's uh, Fellow. She has published widely in both English and uh, Japanese uh, on subjects related to uh, Japan's civil military relations, executive leadership, and then also with implications for uh, Japan's uh, security trajectories. One of her most well-known pieces actually appeared uh, last year uh, in the Foreign Affairs, uh, this very well-known magazine. Uh, it is entitled, Trump's Gift to Japan, Time for Tokyo to Invest in the Liberal Order. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I recommend this to all of you, and it's something that, of course, uh, we read in all our IR and foreign policy uh, classes. So please join me in welcoming Professor Akikotani, uh, who's going to tell us what Japan is or is not able to do in the international order. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. Um, first, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to um, um, University of Washington, especially to Griffith Gray, for this wonderful opportunity to do this lecture here and to Saya for being here. Um, it's been wonderful. I came here last night. It's just a, such a beautiful place and beautiful campus, and I'm enjoying it fully. I met some graduate students this morning, and there were such good questions and tough questions that I kind of had to rethink my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> but um, overall, it's been such a wonderful opportunity to come here. And um, thanks to your kind introduction, I have a slightly interesting background that I taught at the National Defense Academy for 18 years which means that I was a self-defense force member for 18 years. And now I have left the service. Well, I was never a uniform officer, but I was part of the Ministry of Defense. And now um, I teach at Columbia as a civilian. <laughs> and that I'm enjoying my American academic life right now, but I do intend to go back in a couple of years. So this is my adventure in the American universities. And it's been really nice to um, come to a different university. It's a very different campus. And I'm very, very happy to be meeting all of you because I found everybody here to be so friendly and I've been enjoying everything so far. So my title today um, is um, Stepping Up is Hard to Do on Japan's Contribution to the Liberal Democratic Order. And I have the it's hard to do in a parenthesis because that's basically what I'm going to address today is that although I think there's a quite a bit of need for Japan to rethink it's foreign policy, it's not that easy. So today, um, I think for the um, purpose of time, I have sort of just intentionally kept it rather broad, because I would like to invite you to the discussion. I think this is more of a topic that, it's not that I'm gonna argue that Japan is doing this and that. I'm just gonna do like an update on where we are. And I think the important question is what we do from here and there is no good answer yet. And I think that right now, um, there tends to be, like, a, let's, we're kind of holding our breath right now. Because I think a lot of things will depend on how things turn out with North Korea immediately, and also how 
um, during this administration, the alliance relationship might be challenged. So I think we're at a critical moment. So I'm going to be offering what we have right now to offer sort of some kind of an update of what's happening in Japan. But I would love to have more discussion with you about where we should go in the future and what's likely to be the future of Japan and the United States and the relationship between the two countries going forward at this critical time. So usually I don't use PowerPoint, but I thought for today, um, I didn't think the screen will be this big, but I'm trying to um, explain things and, um, and to go in this order. So um, the reason why I'm doing this uh, stepping up is that, um, so I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs, as um, Professor Puckett had just introduced, called Trump's Gift to Japan. And I actually didn't come up with the title, Trump's Gift to Japan, as the editor decided that's a good title. And I thought it's kind of misleading, because I'm not really talking about a gift. But I guess it's a better topic for a magazine sales. And I guess it was good, because I started to think what the gift might be. And the gift, I guess, you're suggesting is that is that an unintentional gift, being that it's kind of a wake-up call for Japan, that things aren't going to be the same anymore. And I argue that it's not just because of Mr. Trump. I think a lot of the changes or the choices Japan has to make was already something that Japan had to make, but it's just it's more clear because it's Mr. Trump. And the reason why I wrote that piece, it was about an issue on how allies were dealing with the Trump administration. But being in New York, I was rather surprised by the way in which the Japanese government, although it's clear that Japan has a lot of stake in keeping the relationship between Japan and the United States well, still the extent to which um, Prime Minister Abe tried to be, seemed to be courting papers from Mr. Trump was really hard to watch actually. So I went to Japan thinking, why is it that Japan seems to be so desperate to be on good terms with Mr. Trump? So that's how I got the, um, um, the piece, I started writing a piece, but then as I wrote, prepared the piece, I thought to think that this is really not enough. That Trump management is not enough, and Japan has to think beyond the Trump management, that even if the couple of years might be okay, it's actually highlighting the issues that Japan needs to think about for some reason they haven't thought about. And Mr. Trump is just like, he's like a walking highlighter in a way of things that could go wrong for Japan. And so we're seeing things highlighted in a way that we never thought before. So today I'd like to think of, uh, talk about um, why Japan needs to step up. And as I said, I don't think it's just because there is an unpredictable president. I think the issues are more highlighted. We're seeing it because of that. And, and, and next I'd like to talk about how things are so far. I would argue that the past 20 years, um, and we have seen a lot of changes, but there's also rather surprisingly no changes through consistency in Japanese foreign policy. I started graduate school just about 25 years ago, and I think there's a lot of things that I thought would change in 25 years that didn't happen, so I'd like to discuss with you why it's been the case. So that's the domestic changes. And then I'd like to turn to what seems to be the current slogan, at least, for where Japan is going forward, that happens to, or not happens to, but is coordinated to be the same as what the US policy is, which is the free and open Indo-Pacific concept. So I'd like to sort of play with that concept and what it means to be a free and open strategy and also what the Indo-Pacific is. But I think there's a lot of same but different dreams situation, which kind of a, it is a convenient vehicle because countries can pretend that they're on the same page. But on the other hand, there's a lot of things that could be included under the slogan. I think, um, just to sort of fast forward, U.S. is U.S. Uh, free and open Indo-Pacific at this point seems to be more um, just a license plate without a car. There isn't much to it yet. I think in Japan's case, you put that slogan on what's already pre-existing, and whether it makes sense altogether is something I'd like to discuss with you. So that's the free and open Indo-Pacific, just as like a guideline for how Japan should step up. And finally, I'd like to look back and look forward and look back at um, past change and how um, 25 years ago we had another stepping up moment. The Gulf War was a wake up point call for Japan. That's when I started graduate school. And there was a lot of talk about Japan needs to do more for the international society and people thought about stepping up for Japan to do more. I think the reasons are slightly different now. And I think it's important to think about what, why it's different. 
I would say it's because it's much more of not so much Japan as a greater power, as a responsibility to do more because we need to. Japan needs to step up for its own survival, and I think the stakes are much higher now, so I'd like to talk about that. And finally, um, since, well, it's kind of fun to think, talk about politics too, I like to, although that's Professor Beckman's specialty, I like to try to uh, venture into that world and talk a little bit about what is going to be the future, immediate future, the same so Prime Minister Abe, and what seems to be the longer future in Japanese politics in determining the way forward for Japan. So that's my plan. And um, so this is, um, it says it's more and disengaged because I, in my foreign affairs piece, I talked about Trump management, how the Japanese government has been doing what it has been doing to the Trump administration. Basically, this arm is that they were very worried about the campaign rhetoric of Mr. Trump, so they tried to get him to not say the things he said about Japan and try to be on good terms. That led to um, rushing to Trump Tower right after Mr. Trump got elected, gave, given him a golden golf club, or would try to think about what he likes. And also they actually did a consulting sort of um, work on what kind of things he, like, what kind of personality he is. I'm sure all countries around the world is doing the same thing, just as people here are doing the same thing on their own. But they did try to make sure what should be done, what shouldn't be done to get on in good terms with Mr. Trump. And this engage was to make sure that politics of it, the substance of the policy making, was actually not dealt with by President Trump, but trying to disassociate him from the policies. That is in security field, they tried to have Mr. Mattis to be in charge, to have a separate track of negotiations to make that happen. And also for the economic issues, they tried to make it uh, between Mr. Trump, I mean Mr. Pence, and Mr. also the finance minister. The intention was not just to have a separate track for each issue, but to keep the two issues separate. That is economic issues and security issues. The Japanese government didn't want, want to tie those two together. And that's what the intent was. And as of um, 2017, June, when I wrote this, it seemed to be somewhat working, that things were disengagement and this armament seemed to be working. And so that's where we were last year. Um, and also they, so this is a picture of their phone call, so they were actually in close contact, and the Japanese government was quite proud that um, Mr. Abe was Mr. Trump's sole trusted advisor, that they would actually be in very close communication, and that um, they were very happy with how things were going. I was almost surprised by the extent to which they were happy. However, I think recent events, actually, I think since this March, things has become very difficult for Japan. One is the um, unexpected announcement of the Kim Trump talk, because I think it, well, I'll be talking about this again later, but the, for the Japanese government, the nuclear issue is not a new issue at all. We have missiles flying over Japan um, very um, often, but we were worried about the missiles um, or the, the delivery capability of being reaching the U.S. could be a game changer in a way that will make the U.S. Um, I hate to use your city, but they were, we used to say that we, the U.S. might be reluctant to trade Seattle over Tokyo. That's the way people put it. But there was a concern that if it is more likely for the North Korean missiles to reach the United States, the United States will be less likely or less inclined to protect Japan at the expense of the U.S. So that discussion of being game changer hasn't emerged, but that's what was in people's minds when they talked about North Korea, and precisely because of the perception that we might have a slightly different interest with the United States now as to what is tolerable situation for North Korea, the getting in a negotiation between Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim is shocking, and also it was the reason why Mr. Abe tried to make sure that they're always on the same page with Mr. Trump. So that has changed. On March 9th, the, uh, Mr. Abe is trying to put on a brave face by saying that it is because we had this uh, strong pressure, including Japan's pressure, that Mr. Kim decided to come to the negotiation table. That is impossible to disprove, but it's also a very hard case to make that that was the reason why he's on the table, at the table now. And now um, the other side um, is that the, um, the fact that Japan was not exempt from the steel um, retaliatory tariffs on steel and aluminum. 
Um, that was also shocking because although as a uh, from an economic point of view, um, steel and aluminum have course to the U.S. Japan is uh, exporting very quality steel, so it doesn't really they're not competing by the price, so they don't really think that it's going to hurt them in terms of their sales. But just symbolically, since other allies were exempt from the tariffs, the fact that Japan was, has not been still exempt has been a shocker for Japan, especially since they were in such good terms. And also some statements that Mr. Trump made about it's little tough for Japan because they've gotten away with murder for 25 years. So um, now, um, but they're going to be changing policy. And in Japan, there was one newspaper translated, they're getting away with murder, literally. And it was a shock that why are they saying that we killed people? But that was just sort of a um, sad English ability problem. But because um, I don't think that's what the potential was. And then also, he also, Mr. Trump also said, uh, Mr. Trump is a really good friend of me, but he's always, he, there must be a little smile on his face saying that I can't believe we've been able to take advantage of the United States for so long. Those days, so those, so those days are over. So there is a sense that although there's, they try to be very friendly with Mr. Trump, he tried to be a lot more unpredictable than they thought, and also his campaign motives or campaign statements are coming back. And now uh, we are here, and I just realized that this is not the most updated version of my PowerPoint for some reason. <laughs> so I would have to try to, um, since there's nothing behind, I will try to improvise from here, because I'm kind of shocked that it happened. I don't know why, but I'm not going to try to update. But this is a picture of Mr. Abe and Mr. Trump, and this is yesterday. And I did try to add some words to it, but it's missing, so I'm not going to add. But basically, what did Mr. Abe get out of this? I arrived in Seattle last evening, and I turned on CNN to see what happened. And they did not talk about, they showed the press conference, but they only showed Mr. Trump. And Mr. Abe was not in the screen. But basically, um, they said that they're on the same page. They're going to be press pressuring North Korea. They're going to add maximal pressure. They, um, Mr. Trump also mentioned that they'll be adding pressure um, on North Korea to get the abductees back because abductees are a big issue in Japan, especially among very strong supporters of Mr. Abe. So that's happening, uh, or at least there will be an effort. But um, but there was no mention of giving an exemption on the steel, and there was no mentioning of actually how exactly they're going to be on the same page with regards to North Korea. So although um, it wasn't really expected that something drastic was going to happen here. Um, if the concern of the Japanese government has always been to disconnect security issue and the economic issue, it became very clear that those two are very much tied. And the President uh, Trump's mind that they think that the North Korean issue, Japan, is very dependent on the US, and that is linked to the US's demands to try to start a free trade, bilateral free trade agreement. So they decided to start some kind of negotiation. So the, in a way, coming back to the Trump's gift, if there was a Trump management that made it look like things were okay, I think it's starting to show that things are not quite okay. But I'd like to point out that it's not really because of Mr. Trump per se. Of course, he's much more unpredictable and not competable than one thought. But I think the issue of North Korea missiles reaching the U.S. that might change the U.S.'s interest is not something new. It could have happened under any other administration. And also, also economic issue. Although we didn't think that trade issue would revive in a way that's so reminiscent of the 80s, we did not see that happening. But it's true that given the changes in the U.S. economy, TPP would have been different under, difficult under a different administration as well. So it's not 100% surprising. So what does Japan do when it seems like the U.S. seems to be have a little bit different interest in how it's engaged in Asia and how the economic interest to the U.S. might turn a little bit more inward and not try to sustain the global free trade system as it would before from its own interest. So why does Japan need to step up? So as I said, it's not really just about Mr. Trump, but I believe that it's because there has been changes on the external and the domestic side of things. Externally, there has been change in the regional dynamics. I'm going to just quote myself, because I think it's a good quote. But it's because rather than continuing as a beneficiary of a liberal order left by the United States, Japan must do everything it can to save that order and to keep the United States from withdrawing it from it altogether. 
And I made that claim especially with regards to Asia, but especially with regards to security. And that um, there is something about U.S. commitment in the region that Japan could almost take for granted. That Japan didn't really need to take into account what it has to do at the regional level. But that is just simply not possible because one, um, compared to what we thought, the China's military is rising very quickly. I'm not the one who would say that China has some malicious intent. I just think that it's more that they're a greater power. They would like to have the power that they think they deserve. But I do think it's happening much faster than what, what was happening in Japan. At the same time, U.S. is not as committed. So those two forces happening together has implications for Japan as what it can do in the region. And also, it's the liberal world space or the free trade is very crucial for Japan's um, survival. Japan is not a rising country in terms of its population. It markets have to come from abroad. Its resources have to come from abroad. So in a way, a free trade system is crucial for Japan's survival. Um, I grew up when, um, when in elementary school, we, all we learned was Japan is very resource poor. So we have to manufacture and, and trade, otherwise we don't survive. This was really something that we were told. And I think it's like now it's hitting us more harder, especially because the economy itself, and there's getting less people, we're gonna be very dependent on uh, outside markets, and we're gonna be so dependent on resources as we ever did. And at the same time, the region is not gonna be as hospitable, hospitable to us because the US is not gonna be as committed, or may not be committed in the region as it once was. So those two together, the external factors show there, and domestic imperatives and constraints. So this is what I'll be discussing now. So how much has Japan done? Because this is not really new. As I said, the pace of Chinese, Chinese military modernization is much faster. Maybe the American retreat is faster because of Mr. Trump, but this is something that Japan knew was coming and has been doing some things, but not have been doing some. So what has Japan been doing? What has it not been doing is something that I'd like to talk about. So um, this is just to show that um, the North Korea missile launches, the speed in which it has been, or the more frequency of the North Korea missile launches has gone up very fast after Kim Jong-il became um, its leader. So this is just to show that. And also, but the more important thing than the number is the fact, as I said, that now North Korea has a missile capacity to reach the United States. So it made people worry that it's going to change the incentives of the U.S. government if and when the North Koreans develop both the nuclear capacity and the possible delivery capacity to have these missiles reach the United States. And didn't really have to show just the enough convincing evidence that might help it was supposedly something that could be a game changer. The other is China's rise. And the China's rise, I'm sure you're familiar with the Bridge and Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, but um, China is, is um, conducting a major infrastructure development program across the region, and in which the economic benefits of this grant that is going to help a lot of developed countries to be connected to the markets in different countries through either land or by the seaports. But the uh, concerns for countries like Japan is that in the course of doing that, there's going to be a lot of dependence on the Chinese economy in China in the countries that is going to be involved. And if they are under China's influence, what happens if the, the relationship between China and Japan suffers? Is it going to make it difficult for Japan to be using the same corridor as what China is going to be developing? And, and this is especially the case with regards to South China Sea. And, I, and this is just to show where are the disputed islands that, you, that the China is militarizing or fortifying. But I guess the more important question is issue for Japan, how much Japan is developed dependent on the Pacific Passage in this area. 99% of Japan's resources have to go through this area. And this is exactly the area that lots of countries are going to be under China's influence. And as I mentioned, I'm not the one to argue that that's going to be a completely a bad scenario for certain for Japan. It's just that it's going to might make things more difficult depending on the relationship between China and Japan, and also China and these respective countries that's going to be hosting in a way where that's going to be a recipient of China's capital and is going to be under their influence. 
And this is happening at, this, at the time when American security assistance to Asia has not been increasing but decreasing. This is just a, a map to show that although that we know that China's modernization and more commitment in the region and their economic growth adding to that is leading to more of an independence on Chinese capital for infrastructure development in the region, at the same time from the military level, where the US has a stronger, much more edge to the Chinese, they're actually decreasing their commitment in the region, which is making the countries more vulnerable to Chinese influence in a way. So that's what's happening at the same time, the rise of China, which I think is more natural extension of what they would think to be their interest for their own survival, and at the same time, less commitment by the United States. So if that's the case, what has been done so far? And I'd like to highlight that, in fact, there has been a lot of changes in Japan that, might, that is going to be a factor in thinking what past Japan has going forward. One is a domestic institutional change, and the other is the um, domestic constraint. So what is the change, especially in terms of what we see today in Prime Minister Abe? So we have a much stronger Prime Minister, um, stronger in the sense that um, I wrote a piece in 2008 that um, says that the Japanese strong, uh, Prime Minister is a lot more extrovert now. Extrovert, I mean by um, Japan is um, Due to electoral incentives, um, I'm not going to go into the details because it's not possible to explain, but there was an electoral system change which led to more demand for the party leader to be more of what people vote for in elections. So there is the money for a leader that will be able to participate or represent the party. And also capable, um, meaning that the prime minister has a lot more power vis-a-vis -vis his own party and vis-a-vis -vis the um, bureaucrats. So in a way, in Japan, the institutional reform led to a need for and the capacity of the prime minister, he wants to exercise it to be much stronger. Because I think most of you remember, Japanese prime ministers tend to be one every year and very weak, and that was what's notable. But what's interesting about Mr. Abe is that although um, he was once prime minister only for one, he's been able to survive much longer this time. And it's not really because he's strong as a person. There's something about his knowledge of how to use the system to his advantage in a way. And that, um, so we've had six prime ministers one year each. So why, why is it that the one, the first prime minister, the first other administration, he was not that strong? Why is he much stronger now? So I, say, I argue that the Japanese prime minister is stronger yet more vulnerable. Since it was it's more clear that things are due to the prime minister, the prime ministers can make things happen, but when things don't happen, it tends to be blamed on the prime minister. So they're more sensitive, more acute, like aware of public opinion, and just the fact that they are more accountable in a way, they have to take accountability, they have to pick blame. So I think that although they're more bound by public opinion, they can actually use the public opinion and public support to make things happen. That's where Prime Minister Abe is. So he's a lot more stronger, yet vulnerable, but if you know how to make the public support you, Mr. Abe is very good about how to manage public opinion and to win elections because Japanese Prime Minister, one of the strengths is they can call for um, on dissolving the, cap, the, um, the diet and to call for elections. He's been very skillful in maintaining what he does. So that's one change that we didn't see 20 years ago, that we have a much stronger prime minister. So a lot has been said about the personality of Mr. Abe, but I think it has a lot to do with the institutional aspect of him being strong. Um, the second thing is that in security policy, one of the relatively um, less noticed development in Japan is the national security of Japan becoming more significant. Uh, we always had something called the Defense Council or the National Security Council. What's different is, as you um, see in the photo, that is a Navy officer. He's the chief of staff advising the prime minister. We used to not have a, a military officer in open like a place advising the prime minister. It was considered not appropriate for our self-defense officers to be involved in politics, which almost which included advising the prime minister. That has changed. So there's a lot more input from the uniform side. And also, it's just that um, as a system, the prime minister actually coordinates at the prime minister level 
um, things have been managed both by the foreign ministry and the, and the defense ministry, so things are a lot more coordinated now. And I'll just skip that. And so also what uh, in, in the National Security Council was established in 2013, um, they also came up with a national security strategy or revised it. And this is actually something also that went relatively unknown. But if you consider that the national defense policy lasted from 1957 to 19, 2013, it was actually a big change, or it could be. But if you examine what the difference is, if you believe, if you think that 2013 what changed, is it because there's been a change in thinking about Japanese security policy to maybe be less dependent on the US? It's actually not that direction. It's interesting how the one we used to have um, had as the well, first objective of national defense in Japan to be um, the basis, basic, basic policy being supporting activities of the United Nations. And you might wonder why in the world United Nations? But when the policy was, was, um, came up in 1957, it was only when the activities of the United Nations or more completely multilateral efforts fell through that Japan would have to um, deal with um, security or utilize security arrangements in the U.S. until the United Nations will be able to fulfill its function. So in a way, this was the official policy, although it really wasn't the case. The United Nations did so much to help Japan, I would say, but there was still a perception that um, in the order of things, in terms of official policy, that this lasted until 2013. But the recent uh, national security strategy is a lot more explicit in how Japan keeps itself safe. And that is that, um, so they are, um, the objective is to deter the threats directly, so this is for direct the defense of Japan, and also that to strengthen Japan-U.S. alliance. So the current defense strategy is more explicit about the role that U.S.-Japan plays in securing Japan. And you can argue if things are gonna change for Japan, if the U.S. incentives are gonna change in the next couple of years, it might be almost ironic that officially U.S.-Japan alliance became most important in 2013, but we have to see what happens later. And, um, and at the same time, what has been um, always consistent is the Constitution of Japan in Article 9. Um, I mentioned that I taught at the National Defense Academy for 18 years, and I never really thought about the self-defense force, though, until I started teaching there, and I think that's really common for most Japanese people who are going through the academics. And it kind of occurred to me that um, I, I went on campus and there were tanks, and they were calling themselves the military. And I was just sort of naively thinking that we don't have anything called that. And that's because I was thinking, reading the Constitution of Japan that we actually memorized in high school, that in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. So although I knew in theory that we had something called the, the self-defense forces, I kind of thought that it's not going to be just right in front of me, and that um, and I was just very interested and intrigued by that that I decided to teach there. But I think that the fact that the Constitution remained the way it was, and the fact that we had we be armed under the same Constitution did not change the Constitution is actually one interesting thing that was the case for Japan. And that, um, and so currently there's been um, proposals for change to either delete the second part of the um, Article 9. Um, but um, that is not going to be likely. So the, the current proposal is to add a provision that makes it sound more legitimate to have the self-defense force around. So I think it's just going to reinforce the status quo in a way. Some argue that it's going to call acknowledge its existence, but I'm kind of surprised that given the fact that Prime Minister Abe has always wanted to revise the Constitution because it was imposed upon us and it was not really what he wanted, what he's going to be calling for probably, even if there is a referendum for the Constitution is actually going to be more status quo oriented than otherwise. Um, and at the same time, the, the combination of what we think we have in Japan has always been the Constitution on the one hand, and the, um, the security relationship, security treaty with the United States. So in a way, how do you make the two happen at the same time has been the puzzle, and how to let the two things as two sides of the same coin was the challenge and the consistency for Japan. Some called it the Yoshida Doctrine formula. I tend not to use that because I think it, 
include so many different meetings that it's not useful. I still think for security policy, it's easier to think that how to maintain Article 9, but how to play a greater role in the um, US-Japan Treaty, although US is not, Japan, US is entitled, is, is expected to come to Japan's defense, but Japan is not expected to come to the US defense. So it's not completely symmetrical, but they have to have the asymmetrical treaty and the constitution at the same time and how to have the United States committed to that, although it is fundamentally somewhat unfair, has been a challenge for the administrations in Japan all through history. And um, this is why, where I actually changed my um, PowerPoint, so I'm going to try to, um, and I don't know why it, it's not reflecting the most recent, but um, so um, there was one more slide in between, but I'm just going to skip. So what, what are the recent changes? So what happened between uh, in, the, in the 20, these 20 years is try to somewhat have the two um, the demands of the treaty and the constitution somewhat more consistent. And I, I have this slide that I don't have right now, which is, um, I wonder if you have a picture, if you have known of a picture of it called how law, how, 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 how long does a rubber band stretch? And it's about a story of a girl that keeps on stretching a rubber band, and they can actually and, um, even reach the moon, at which point he springs back. And I was always thinking that um, how much are they going to stretch the Constitution? How much is the interpretation of the Constitution able to stretch before it kind of springs back? And I think right now, at this moment in time, it's almost as if the debates that took place recently was kind of over the reaction to how much the Constitution can actually stretch without changing the self. And the, um, so although there's been a lot of talk about Constitution, the, the legislation was very difficult to pass in the, um, in the Diet. What it achieved was um, that now Japan can exercise uh, flood the self-defense, which is that um, it could be to the go to the defense of other country, not its own, uh, only under the, the use of force allowed when um, when an arm attack against a foreign country that is in a close relationship with Japan occurs, and as a result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger to fundamentally overturn J people's right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that is a very tortured language, but that is how limited to what Japan can do now in collective self-defense. And also Japan can um, enable provision of support activities to not just the U.S., but foreign countries Armed forces and that's a change. But this is the, this having this change go through diet took a lot of discussion, a lot of political energy. So that is still, even I think it's fair to say that this, although you can interpret this as saying it can open up to a lot of things, I think you would agree that this is quite still limited. And just to get this through was very hard. That's how strongly the Japanese public actually appreciates the status quo and would like to keep the tortured relationship between the Constitution and the, and the U.S.-Japan treaty. And in addition to that, I'm not going to read everything, but the provisions for peacekeeping operations in Japan is still very strict. That um, in most U.N. peacekeeping categories that happen today, Japan is unable to send any forces because it just doesn't follow what the Japanese forces um, expect. And um, from here, you know, it's I guess I, should, I have to kind of try to explain in between. So this was, um, so what I'm saying is that um, the changes that took place um, is actually very limited, and let's go on how to see what Japan can do differently given the domestic constraints that it has today. Um, so is Japan able to break through this and to increase the defense budget? Well, it's going to be very hard because the demographic constraints are such that it's not very plausible for Japan to expect its economy to increase or expand. Um, this is just to show that um, Japan's population is likely to decline. And this is, um, and also um, what's in green is that there's going to be a much higher proportion of um, people over the age of 65 or 75. But by the year 2025, we expected that one in five Japanese are going to be over the age of 75. And that means that it's going to be, in terms of how Japan provides its social security, there's going to be a lot more for the younger generation to have to come up with. 
And I'm also, this is a population pair, and this is just to emphasize the point that we're going to be a very much what is called um, um, not a pyramid shape, but a bell shape that is going to be much more heavily. We're going to, we just have much less people who are young, and that's not going to change. At the same time, the budget constraint is that um, we have been accumulating a lot of national debt that we've been spending. The red is expenditure, blue is the revenue, which means that we've been spending a lot more than we're collecting by taxes, so this is just going to be very difficult to maintain. And also, in terms of what the expenditures go to, um, debt servicing, which is just to pay back for the debt, is actually the quarter of the budget. So we don't have that much leeway in terms of what we can spend. And that Social Security is, is about one-third, and this is going to increase um, just because of how the demographics are. And the defense is about 5%, but I can see that if you're going to double the defense budget, it's going to be 10%, but you can see from the structure that it's very difficult to do. Um, and the defense budget itself is very rigid, that about close to half goes to personal expenses, and there's a lot of, uh, there is very little um, room for um, newer equipment. So, um, so what, is, what has been Japan doing, even given those, those constraints? So the most recent change of to Korea, they have been amping up on what they can buy for um, defense equipment. But I guess what's, what I'd like to highlight today is stepping up through what's called the free and open the Pacific, and there's three areas, security, economic, and values, and those I'd like to go in order. So this is the free and open Indo-Pacific concept as it is conceptualized by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I did not come up with this PowerPoint. This is what the Minister of Foreign Affairs has as how they explain the free and open Indo-Pacific concept. And the reason why I highlight this is because, as I mentioned, this is the same language as what is used by Mr. Trump in the national security strategy, and many uh, Japanese government officials are proud that they convinced Mr. Trump to use this strategy. I don't think that's necessarily true. The language is already was in the US military literature, so it just came out that way, um, in the same way. But what this means is that Japan is trying to do um, the, the diplomacy that takes a primarily perspective of the world map is one slogan they've used in the past. And proactive contribution to peace is also another slogan they've used in the past. But basically arguing that Japan is going to step up in the region and try to argue that the two, the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean has to be connected. And you can see how this map actually looks very much similar to what I showed for the China's Belt and Road Initiative. So although it doesn't run counter to it, it's not trying to um, contain what China's doing, it has a lot of attention on what implications that's going to have. So what to make of the Great Open in the Pacific? So some argue that it's just old wine and new bottle because it's like a free same slogan in one thing, but I think it's important to highlight the three aspects. What, is, what does it actually mean to be free and open? And I think it has three aspects, as I said, the military aspect, the free trade aspect, and possibly a values aspect. Is it about democracies doing something together? Is it values because it's something that China seems to have a different value? Is that the way things are going to be placed? So I'm just going to skip this and try to go forward. So basically, the, the case for a new Japan US strategy, this is something that uh, one of the assistant uh, director general, the National Security Secretariat, a very a mastermind, he is said to be Mr. Abe, explained the Indo-Pacific concept. He said that Japan is ready to lead again this time to create a free and open Indo-Pacific by supporting freedom of navigation, maritime law enforcement, as well as infrastructure upgrades in a way that meets global standards. So this is basically trying to catch up with what China is doing in a region, and so this has a more of a competitive tone to it. But I think it's also important to note that what Japan is doing is not just to try to compete, because after all, Japan is not the US, Japan is not China. Japan cannot drive these businesses to invest in a certain way. Japan does not have the capital that China has. So from a pragmatic point of view, um, this is just a list, but they're trying to work with the Chinese bridge and road initiatives and you think. So in a way, although the slogan is that they're trying to replicate in a way what China is doing with the bridge and road initiative, in fact, what they're trying to do is trying to address China in a way that actually meets with what they do, but trying to incorporate their standards and what China is doing their development, and not to try to compete to like to protect in a way because there's just no way that Japan can compete. 
compete with China's economic power at this point. And um, and this is just um, this is the manga Defense of Japan 2017 <laughs> that the Ministry of Defense actually does come up with as an official document. The only reason I'm showing this is that in fact, in the past 20 years, Japan's self-defense forces has been deployed to different places in the world. But what's striking about this map is that this shows all the, the different deployments, whether it's peacekeeping or disaster relief. But, but the only thing that's remaining that the Japanese self-defense force is doing is the um, is the anti-piracy activities in the Gulf of Aden. Everything else is not happening right now. So although we, if you thought that the self-defense force is going to be utilized, this is actually not happening. And the reason for that is that the, the Japan's rules for peacekeeping operations are so stringent that there's no way they can send their officers or their, their troops to anywhere. And so it says, we call various peace contributing activities in response to requests from international conflict com um, committee as international peace cooperative missions as part of the, that includes PKO. You, could, you do so much more than capacity building assistance. In fact, we have conducted many activities overseas. And we're saying this because they don't do peacekeeping right now anymore. And it's, in fact, what they're doing is what's called capacity building assistance, which um, I'd like to point out to. So what is the security aspect of the Indo-Pacific if Japan is not trying to completely counter China? Um, this is also another strategy Japan has been doing prior to Mr. Trump, but it's more and more significant now, is that they're trying to support the countries in Southeast Asia by building up the capacity for them to uh, monitor freedom of navigation operations in the region. And I think it's worth noting that, um, so they've been able to um, supply ships. There's been changes in the provisions of self-defense law that they can actually offer used vessels to different countries now. So that used to be not permitted, now that's happening. So they've been offering 13 vessels to um, uh, Vietnam and to the Malaysia, and the Indonesia, and the Gulf, to Philippines. So in a way, they have been engaged in trying to, like, to have support the Southeast Asian countries to accept those ships to be able to monitor the um, areas that they are concerned of. But I think what's interesting here is that if you think that China is just so, um, like, um, in a very competitive mood, they could uh, like make life much more difficult for the recipient countries to actually refuse these vessels. But that's actually not happening. So there's something about, I believe, what's happening in Asia to be, nobody really wants a all-out competition, but there's something about the uh, way in which the free and open of the Pacific is not really functioning in a way that completely counters China, but in some ways some countries are accepting or being able to take advantage of the fact that both Japan, instead of the United States to a certain extent, is trying to reach out to these countries, and these countries are actually somewhat under the influence of China, but not to the extent that they will be on bad terms with China as a result of that. So that's what's happening. So what's the stepping up on economic terms? I think what's clear is that Japan went ahead with TPP, and that's very different than what we had expected. I thought Japan would be more reluctant to go ahead without the United States, but that's not happening, so that's one thing. And I think, well, what's more notable is that Japan went ahead to, with, with um, the EU to join what's called the Economic Partnership Agreement, which is going to enable more, um, uh, like, no, like um, EU, EU, EU and Japan make up 38% of world GDP and 40% of world trade, and there's going to be literally um, no tariffs on each other for that, so that's going to be very massive. So, in a way, prior to the Trump administration, Japan has been trying to expand its own free trade regime on economic terms abroad, and it has been quite successful in doing that. And finally, I guess one thing that I'd like to question, this is my last point, is the values. Um, I'm not sure if we have an impression that Japan is very value-oriented as a diplomacy. Um, there has been different arguments about whether Japan has been more mercantilist in its orientation and whether that was a strategic decision to do so. I think, in fact, um, Japan has got its own way to be more pragmatic as for lifting sanctions after Tiananmen Square and all that they have made more pragmatic decisions. But it wasn't really not, like, not value-laden, but I think that the interesting change was from the Cold War to post Cold War to post 9 11. I think during the Cold War, you really didn't have to make choices, but you were on one side or the other in terms of values. And post 9 11, we had a post Cold War, we had a moment of 
which we thought about what the values are for Japan's democracy. Uh, um, um, ODA abroad, we thought about whether democracy should be a condition for giving aid. But after 9-11, it came back to you are either with us or against us kind of rhetoric, and Japan's foreign policy tended to be dictated by that, and the values part tend to come with this relationship with the U.S. And I think we've come around the brown circle. We're asking once again whether we should have the values as a with us or against us type of concept. And I think that's very relevant today when we think about Asia. As I mentioned, what we have, what Japan has been doing in Asia in terms of both reaching out in terms of trade and in terms of security has been not to directly compete with China, but to try to find a way in which countries still need to make a stark choice between China and Japan. Um, and that's been, I think, what they've been trying to do. And if that's the case, attaching too much value to what it does as if it's going to be whether you're going to take China we're going to be take Japan. I don't think. I personally don't think it's a good way to go. But but with that, under the slogan of free and open in the Pacific, there is a lot more language of democracy, and that's attached to rule of law. But the implicit assumption is because China is not following the rule of law. But I personally think, although it's very important to uphold certain principles, and that's one of the reasons why I think Japan should uphold the liberal democratic order, it shouldn't be presented in a way that it's either with us or without us. And I think that's kind of an easier um, thing to fall into, but I don't think it's helpful for the countries in the region if we present it as such. So that's my feeling about the value diplomacy, but that's something that is starting to get um, questioned in Japan. So um, looking back and looking forward. So looking back, so as I mentioned when I started graduate school, I thought Japan was going to be doing more contribution. Like stepping up in a way Japan is a great power, Japan should be able to do more good in the world. So I thought Japan was going to step up. And then with the peacekeeping law, I thought the Japanese self-defense force was going to be more progressive. I thought maybe the constitution itself might change to accommodate that. Not whether it's a good or not option. I thought given the fact that the self-defense force is going to be used a lot, they would have to make some changes to the constitution. The reality is that they've been more resilient about the constitution, but at the same time, the stakes are much higher. So as I said about the rubber band, I think it's really much more tense right now in terms of what we actually do without changing the constitution has gone to a very tough place right now. And so moving forward, there will be minor changes to the constitution, maybe if uh, Mr. Abe gets that through, but it's going to be in terms of Article 9 very minor. So whether or not we're going to have the Article 9 and the U.S.-Japan alliance relation to be the way it is and the way it is in terms of what Japan chooses, going forward is going to be very much a question. And one slide that was missing was why, though Japan is, Japanese public so dependent on Mr. Trump and so trustful of the US Japan alliance, one thing that I didn't show you that I was missing was that the Japanese public has over the years overwhelmingly supported the US Japan alliance to be the way to make Japan safe. It's been over the years over 70%, 80% that has looked at US Japan alliance as to be the most viable way to keep Japan safe. So that and the constitution value has been something that the Japanese public would want to keep, no matter what. But I think it's also true that support for the US alliance might be softer than anything. That if you look at the answers to opinion polls, it's generally, um, it's about 70%, but half of it is yes, definitely, and half of it is relatively speaking. And what, what difference there is in terms of preference is that if I ask the same question, in the same sort of same kind of sort of same same language in the survey for the civilian elite and self-defense of officers, they're much more confident about the use of license than the public. So the public, I'm sure, I, I I believe, as I said in the bottom, is that they are actually a lot more worried about the use of alliance than one might think. And some sign that the US might actually not be committed would sway public opinion in a different way. I don't think it's going to sway in a more of an independent defense position given the constraints that I mentioned. What I'm saying is that if there is any signs that U.S. is not as committed to protect Japan, there could be changes much more so in the, at the public level than what you might hear at the elite level. So I think at the elite level or policymaker level, there's a much stronger consensus for the alliance. You hear that more often, but if you do public opinion polls, it's a lot more softer than you think. And I'm not. And so what, how should we go forward? I think it's some challenge for the U.S. It's a U.S. decision, so it's not that I'm saying that you have to be with it. I, I hope they will continue, but I just think it's a lot more contingent. And I think what happens in the region 
let have matters less to the Japanese than what the U.S. decides to do. And I think that's where the Japanese public right now, although there hasn't been that much coverage of what's happening between Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe, this is a really critical moment because the North Korea issue will be a test of how much the U.S. is committed to the security of the region. And that's where Japan's security policy, as I said, is so dependent on. And basically, this past 20 years has been doubling down on the alliance relationship and not opting for something else. And I think right now might be, after 20 years of doubling down, the, t the moment to actually, that might be to change depending on how things happen with the um, Trump administration. So I think rather than to go to the next two, I'm just going to stop here and hopefully open for a question. I'm sorry, I actually missed a couple of slides I should have gone through. So I'm sorry if it wasn't as coordinated as it should have been, but this is basically my bottom line is Japan stepping up. But not because Japan is trying to do something greater. It's because I think it's for its survival. It has to step up with the expectation that things are going to be a lot more complicated in the region and with the perception that the U.S. is not going to be committed as before. So they're taking the pragmatic steps that they can. But it's not so much in a way that is anti-China as you might think. They're trying to work out a way that is more amicable with the rest of the region, and that's where we are. And if you have any more ideas or better ideas for Japan is stepping forward, I would like to know because I think right now we're doubling down on Mr. Trump. If there's a better way out at this point, I'd like to know too. So thank you very much for your attention.